as many of you know, I came out of the music industry where I used to perform around the country as a professional trumpet player. Um, and I still play every day and I still perform. And it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of practice. And when I was on the East Coast, there were people who didn't want to uh, tell you how they learned certain things. They didn't want to tell you how they figured certain, certain things out. There was even a trumpet player back there that used to play with a handkerchief over his hand so you couldn't watch his fingerings, which was incredibly stupid because all you needed to do is record his solo and sound it out. But that's beside the point. But the thing is, is that I have now been working for six years on trying to figure out how to breed the Synodonis lucifinus. And people have said, my goodness, you work all this stuff out. You don't want to, you know, those are your secrets. It's like, no, I would rather go ahead and post this on out and show you exactly how I do things. Um, everything you see here, it's only finally beginning to work for me. It literally has taken me six years. Um, I've tried just about every setup you could use. Uh, the problem is that you can breed the Lucipinus and get like 50 a month with, you know, a number of females and a couple of males. But the problem is that they lay thousands of eggs. So you want to work out a means by which you're returning 50, 60%. Um, of the eggs that are laid, um, and I was not achieving anything close to that. Plus, I also had some fundamental problems with getting it going. I didn't have a batch of eggs until I'd been trying for over two years. So anyway, now I finally have a lot of these things worked out, and what I'm going to show you here is, is simply how I do it. It's a little more complex than some people might want to do, deal with, but when you see me solve a problem in a certain way that might not be in a way you want to, want to solve yourself, then think about that variable and how you want to solve it. Um, for instance, in my breeding setup, I use three tanks. You don't need three tanks necessarily if you have water quality that's already at the hardness and, and the, uh, 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 the pH that you want it to be at. So anyway, those sorts of things. So I hope you enjoy this video. Um, a lot of time and effort's got into putting this together. And uh, if you have any questions about, about these guys and how to breed them, uh, certainly email me at selectaquatics at gmail.com and we can just continue the discussion further. Thanks. This is my area for breeding the Synodonis lucipinus, these four tanks. And how this works and what's going on will be explained here in a moment. But when you breed the Synodonis lucipinus, you have four issues. Now this here is the breeding tank. And those four issues are getting them to breed, harvesting the eggs, getting the eggs to hatch, and then raising the fry. And each one of those um, took a, quite a bit of, uh, of time and many months uh, to get worked out as to what solved that problem. Initially, this four tank setup solves the harvesting the eggs problem. When they're breeding, as they're doing in this tank, and I will go more thoroughly into the pots and the containers below them and what's in them and all of that, but when you want them to breed, you want to harvest the eggs. The eggs are very, very tiny and they lay many of them. In this tank there's about eight females and three males and they lay about a thousand eggs uh, when they're bred. So you want to try and get, get as many of those eggs as possible. You don't want them to do their spawning in a substrate, which they'll do if there's any gravel in the tank. So you have to have a tank that they're breeding in where they're forced to do their spawning where you want them to spawn. In this case it's in the pots which they do and they never spawn outside of the pots but if I had substrate they would spawn in that. The problem is that my water is about 90 ppm and 7.4 pH so the water is not hard enough for them. They want uh, something closer to Lake Tanganyikan conditions where they come from so normally you would put in a crushed coral or a crushed oyster shell substrate since that's not possible, because I want to harvest the eggs, what I have is I've set up another tank down here that's a 29 gallon. And when I'm not breeding, I'm, I keep them extra males in here. And right now I have some adult myi in there. But in this tank, I keep some crushed coral. And four times a day for an hour, this pump pumps water up here in to this tank as well as this tank here where the young are grown out. So this three tank system is um, how I've managed to solve the water quality problems they require for breeding. The fourth tank here is a grow out tank for the young once they come out of the breeder tank at the top right. 
Okay, so I realize this looks a little complex, but it really isn't. All you've got here is a, a tank on this bottom right with a uh, about a 150 gallon per hour pump uh, located down there. And it's pumping the water up into these two top tanks. And then as the water in the two top tanks fill, it drains out automatically with the drain siphon that's described in my water change video. And um, so you've got uh, the, the pump down there hooked into a fill line, which are these guys here. It comes up, it just breaks off. This is adjusted so that not too much water goes into the tanks at a time. So it comes on in and then fills in here. It's currently running at the moment. And then these are just the standard uh, uh, external loop uh, drain devices that I describe how to build uh, in the uh, Select Products Presents water change video, water change system video. And then those two drain down and then go back down into this tank. So, so the water is circulating between the three tanks. So that's how that's built. It's a little bit of a little bit tricky at first to get the uh, to get it adjusted so that uh, you don't have uh, uh, too much water going up so the tanks above don't overflow and that the drains and the fills are about the same. And then of course whenever you fill a line like this from a pump and you have it going up as this one does, in this case I always provide an escape valve and this allows the excess water, more water than the pump, uh, can, uh, it's excess water that the pump is producing that I don't want going into the top tank so they will overflow. And then down here, this goes off into this tank. If ever I have a situation where I want to drain uh, some water out of the uh, three tank system and drain it into that other tank. But, uh, so you've got the line coming down, your overflow valve goes up, uh, fills both tanks. As the tanks fill, they drain out to the drains, back down into the bottom tank. And this is how it looks. Pretty simple. It's about an afternoon's worth of work, but it can be done. You will see as I go through this process that I went through, that what I attempt to do is find out what, what the problem is I'm having, isolate that problem, and then fix it, and then move on. And making a permanent, long-term fix for every issue that comes up. So for instance, where someone else may say, oh, I can breed that fish, I just put them in this kind of thing and just do this, that, or the other. Myself, I need to know exactly why it's working and what is going to work consistently. And so that's the approach I took throughout this process. In fact, at various stages of this process where I felt really stumped or I had spent many months trying to get past a problem that didn't seem to be uh, getting resolved, I did contact a few people in the hobby that were well known for, for breeding these fish and tried to explain the problem I was having, what was going on, but I didn't really get any help from anyone simply because most of them said, you know, I'm breeding it this way and this works for me and, you know, good luck. Um, as opposed to saying, okay, here's what's going on and uh, here's how you fix it. So in this case, with my setup, at each time I run into issues, I'll explain what problem I was having and then what I did to fix it. So that when you're setting up your system where your water might be different or your uh, different variables might uh, be different than what I'm dealing with, uh, you have more tools to, uh, to revert back to to find a solution that will work for you. Most of the time when you build something like this to try to solve a problem, it does solve the problem but you end up coming out with a number of other things that are solved as well and that's always a great thing. So I always know when I set out to do something like this to solve a small problem that I'll probably make life easier for myself down the road otherwise. And in this case, this was certainly the case. The reason is because if you keep this fish for any period of time, you'll come to learn that they're pretty sensitive to water quality. Um, if you add uh, fresh tap water to their tank, they start swimming around really irritated and very uncomfortable, start scratching against the surfaces. And that's if you add more than about 15-20% of uh, chlorinated water to your tank. I can usually add up to 40% chlorinated water to most of my tanks. The fish don't seem concerned about it. 
Well, with these guys, you'll actually kill some fish uh, doing that. I actually did wipe out a tank of fry uh, putting in too much water in a water change once because I just really don't like the difference in water quality. So they do best with water changes of old water if at all possible. So what I do with this setup is this top left tank where the breeders are, this top right tank where the young are, and this bottom right tank where the uh, substrate is, um, and right now isolated males are, isolated females are kept in that top left tank when I'm not breeding them. When I do water change, the, the, this tank here on the bottom right is the only one that has a, uh, a, a drain that goes into the main system. So any water that comes into these top tanks, more than the tanks can hold, is drained down to this bottom right tank where it drains out. So since the water is being pumped into the other tanks from that tank about four times a day for about an hour, I can add fresh water to this tank down here and it's fully diluted and the fish up here then are getting pretty much, um, you know, pretty comfortable water for them. So if I add, say, a 15% water change to this 29 down here, then by the time it gets diluted and dispersed to that 29-gallon tank and gets up to these top tanks, the fish, don't, the fish don't even notice the difference and are certainly not bothered by it. Now when I'm dealing with eggs and new young, I go ahead and I do not have water going into this tank and I just turn this off. And then this way, this doesn't get water changes. But right now there are older young in there. And uh, so there's actually about 75 in here somewhere. They're all been fed and they're all resting, so they're all hiding. But they're in there. But anyway. I will then have the water changes going into that tank after they're about a week, week and a half old. And then lastly, because it is a sump type system, you have the advantage that each fish feels that it's in a body of water that's much larger than they're actually in. So for instance, in that top left breeding tank, I have, as I mentioned, 10, 11 adult fish, and I don't need to worry about uh, uh, bacterial blooms and water quality issues uh, because the water is being recirculated through all three tanks on a, on a regular basis. In this case, I've got a 29 on the bottom, a 15 on the top left, and a 20 breeder on the top right. And that was mostly just to fit the rack um, and not have, you know, have to give myself some aisle space. If I probably had to do it again, I'd put two 20s on top. Okay, so the first thing you've got to get taken care of is get the catchment basin created um, for collecting the eggs. And I went through a number of different contraptions, which I talked about earlier in the video. But in this case, I settled on using the upturned pot deal with a, with a catchment basin below. So now, <clears throat> the thing about using the, the standard pot plants that you get at a Home Depot or whatever is getting this hole in the front. And um, I had a friend who had a shop and he had a lathe and said, oh, I've got a drill and it's no problem. We'll you know, bring a few down. We'll knock those suckers out and give you all the, all the caves you can, you can need. Uh, I took 10 pots down to his place and came home with three and seven broken pots. So it's not the easiest thing to do. You can get ceramic drills and such to drill in here and create a bigger hole. Um, and because uh, the, the catfish don't need a very big hole, it doesn't have to be this large. But um, you do need to get a, a hole in here that the fish can go in and out of. On the bottom of the pot is this plastic lavalier light diffusion material that you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever. And um, I have it cut to fit in here and it's glued in here with silicone. But in this case, I can lift it out <clears throat> and to the bottom of it, I have attached with electrical ties, um, cut to fit a piece of uh, plastic cross, cross stitch backing, which is uh, perfect for allowing the eggs to come through because the eggs are very small. The adults can't get to them. Uh, any movement going on in the, in, the, in, the, in the pot from the adults swimming around won't bring the eggs back up into the water column. And once they go down through here, they hit the marbles, they, they stop. So um, that works right in there. And so when I first started this, as I mentioned, I was using a glass bowl, glass cereal bowl kind of thing, because I thought, well, you know, if I'm waiting for them to spawn, I want to be able to see the eggs. Well, the problem is, is that as I learned more about how to spawn them and force to spawn them at certain times, then the issue of being able to see the eggs became moot. 
And uh, so I, I started being able, going with darker uh, containers, particularly since I knew that light, the, the eggs would affect the, the uh, hatch rate um, uh, if they were, if they were show, too much light was shown on them or the young when they're younger. But I still had low fertility rates and couldn't figure out why. And we had the same problem at the university where I was working, where we were breeding these. And the graduate student was looking into this and came up with the conclusion that the distance between where the parents are spawning up in the pot and the distance that the egg and the milk, the eggs and the milk fall to get to the bottom of the container was such a distance that fertilization wasn't happening as effectively as it could. So uh, there, was, there was an effort then to find a way to get this six inch pot to fit over a, a, a catchment container that was lower where the spawning that went on uh, was not that far distant from the floor of the aquarium. So I was walking around the store one day <clears throat> and I saw a display of these, these, uh, these breakfast bowls that I recognized for being shorter stature than the regular cereal bowls. And uh, yes, they look pretty silly. They got the dinosaurs on the side and such. And I'm sure the cashier thought I was really strange that I bought like eight of them. Um, but I grabbed them up because they've got you know a much shorter distance from the top to the bottom and they're still cut at a six inch distance so that they fit really well uh, under the pot. Then these are filled with, with marbles. And one of the issues about putting marbles in this that had eluded me is that when you put the marbles in like this and the eggs fall in amongst the marbles, I remember when I first did this, <clears throat> I thought, I don't want to do that because I've got to remove all the marbles one by one to get to the eggs. And I remember seeing other people in other videos that did just that. You know, well, the eggs are in there now, so we're going to remove the marbles one by one carefully. That, and then, then I had someone show me that all you got to do is you remove this from the aquarium, you put it over another container, put your hand over it, go ahead and pour the eggs out and the water out, have another container nearby of water, fill it back up again, go to the other side, drain it out, pour, uh, pour out the eggs, pour out the water, and you will end up getting just about 100% of the eggs out of there um, uh, cleanly and easily without doing any harm to anything. And, um, and it works really great. So, uh, so that's, how, uh, that's how I go ahead and how I harvest the eggs. So you're gonna want to, to create something like this. It's difficult to, uh, uh, to, to, to do this without it, having, without it being just pretty much like the way it is there. Um, good luck with it. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to write me at selectaquatics at gmail.com. Thank you. So the next thing you'll need to, uh, uh, to, to put together is something that has been what has been the successful uh, trick to breeding these guys for me. The problem I was having is that from the time the eggs were hatching until the time they were able to take in brine shrimp three times a day um, comfortably, uh, there's, the, there, there's a period of time there where they are on the yolk sack. I was never sure exactly when that was. Um, if I introduced the brine shrimp too early, water quality would suffer and it would kill the batch if they weren't ready for it. Um, if I waited too long uh, and I waited more than maybe a day after when they should be, begin eating, then I would lose batch from, from starving. So what I did was I figured I had to find a way to create a, an enclosed environment within the larger tank that they're going to be released into that I have control over the water conditions and can uh, go ahead and keep the water quality up through some type of a mechanism for water to go to go into the container where the young are. The problem is that with these guys, what I found out early on, if you take the eggs, put them in a container, say a shoebox container, float it in the tank where the eggs were laid, and then stick an air stone in that container, it kills the batch. Um, the amount of oxygenation or the gases that are put into the water or whatever it is, um, uh, and I've heard this from people who have bred other species that say this is very common, uh, that uh, too much turbulence, too much air um, will we'll wipe the batch out. So um, I did find that a just a little bit of disruption they can tolerate. Too much disruption of the water, um, they don't and, and, and they, they die off. So what I did was I, I created this. This is my first one and it's great for up to about two to three hundred eggs. <clears throat> and what it is, is this day a shoebox? One side's cut out. This is a lift, just a lift tube that I bought at a pet store. I drilled a hole into the side here. Got a piece of airline tubing going in. There's no air stone or anything in here. It's just the uh, 
A piece of airline tubing sticks down in here. When air goes into here, the bubbles come up and it brings a, a layer, a, a level, a, a flow of water into the into the uh, container. And then, of course, with a valve, you can control exactly what, what it is. <clears throat> the young are very, very tiny. And I learned early on that um, the young synodontists have two spines that come out of the sides of their heads. And if the sponge filter or the filter material you're working with is too broad of a porous uh, nature, then they actually will get stuck into the side of the uh, sponge filter. Um, I actually lost a whole batch one time in a, a little, one of those little square standard sponge filters where the whole batch just had their tails sticking out, the heads were all stuck in there and they couldn't get out and killed the whole batch. So you've got to be really careful that you don't want to have them swimming underneath this and getting stuck into this. This is just a piece of foam. Um, I cut this from a, uh, a 22 inch square, I believe, piece of foam that I got at a, uh, um, at a, like a Hobby Lobby kind of place and then cut it up. So the solution was to go ahead on the bottom here where this foam is going to lay is I put a multi-layer thick thing here of electrical tape so that when the foam is put in, the The way that this is sitting against the bottom prevents the young from being to get under, able to get under there, and it um, uh, overcomes any imperfections in the bottom of the plastic container, so that the young can't get in there. And this worked quite well. And I just went ahead and wrapped a couple electrical ties around to hold the sponge in place, and it floating attached to the side of the tank with some duct tape, control the amount of water going in just a little bit at a time. Water would work its way out the sponge. And um, all of a sudden, I was getting huge batches. But I realized pretty soon on that uh, this wasn't going to be big enough for some of the batches I was getting, because oftentimes I will get more than a thousand eggs in a month of uh, breeding the number of females and males that I've got. So I thought, well, this has worked. So let's take it the next step. So this is the same idea. A little bit larger of a container, more of the same sponge material. Here, I glued in a, a strip of a twin wall polycarbonate that provides a shelf under here. The sponge, uh, the foam then sits on top of that little shelf and the result is that the fry then can get underneath the sponge with enough space that it don't get stuck, which is a natural place for them to want to go because it's dark. And then they, uh, they, they, they swim under there and they grow out there without any harm to them. Uh, same idea here, uh, you know, air going in. Uh, this sits in a 20, uh, a 20 gallon uh, breeder, um, really snug. And so it doesn't go in any deeper than about here. So, so far, uh, this has worked really great as well. And like I said, it's next step up. Um, I haven't used it to its full capacity yet but um, I've, I've only had a few batches in here. I haven't had a good thousand egg kind of a batch yet, and uh, we'll see how it does. But anyway, the control of the water quality you've got while they're going through that period between the time they hatch until the time they use up the yolk sac until the time they first start eating and then to get uh, fairly free swimming and, and put on that first initial size is all important, and this allows you to do that. So, thank you. The females, meanwhile, have been in this uh, breeding tank here. They've been allowed to stay in the, uh, with the uh, pots and the, and the uh, uh, dishes below uh, for the last month. They were cleaned thoroughly uh, two days ago. And then yesterday, the big males, three big males were put in this tank with uh, eight females. And so now I, I wrestled quite a bit this month. I'm still trying to determine the best day to breed them before the full moon. So this time they were put together 11 days before the full moon, so today it's 10 days still out. Uh, I don't see many, much spawning activity yet, but it'll happen. And then what I do then is check those containers every 12 hours for eggs. So this morning I checked, they were put in yesterday evening. Uh, there were no eggs this morning. And so as soon as we've got eggs going, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go to the next step. With this next batch, 
Um, I have chosen an older, one of the more experienced males, uh, and two younger, higher white males, and then eight females. So there are, there are 10 uh, fairly large fish in here. The, the two males that I just introduced, it'll be their first spawning. There's one of the new males there. And this is about as small as they'll be before they'll be ready to start breeding. And I'm hoping that I'm able to get some spawns out of them. So anyway, the full moon is the 30th of this month. And so I'm going to, I'm shooting for a little bit earlier so that the young males have an opportunity to get drawn into the behaviors of the, the seasoned male and the, uh, the females that have bred before. So I put them together on the 20th. Uh, today is the 21st, there haven't been any eggs yet. And now we'll continue to check every morning and every evening for eggs uh, until uh, the full moon in another uh, 10 days. When I first started breeding these guys, I would check for eggs every couple days, like most people do. And sometimes I would find eggs, um, and I'd put them into a breeder, into a, uh, a shoebox container. But they would always fungus up. You know? Usually when I find them, they'd be very fungus. So I couldn't figure out, at first I thought I wasn't getting a high fertility rate, and I couldn't figure out what, what the problem was. So I realized that since they generally spread around the full moon, that if I separated them uh, and then put them together just before the full moon, I, was, I would be kind of forcing them to breed. And then I could check for eggs more frequently um, and then make sure as soon as I get the eggs to get them right in enough to the blue so that the chances of their fungus eat up are lessened. Came to find out that, uh, that it worked great and that it increased my hatch rate tenfold uh, it made a huge difference. But to do this, it has to be simple and it has to be easy. It can't be a pain in the butt. Because you end up checking, like what I was doing, I would check first thing in the morning at 8 o'clock, and then I would check again at night by 8, 9 o'clock. So <clears throat> I want it to be fast and I want it to be quick, so I can check to make sure that I have eggs or I don't have eggs. And so it's a very easy way to do it. So this is the breeding uh, tank, of course. Take the top off. Then over here, I have ready a, a shoebox container uh, that the eggs, if there are any, are going to go into. And then this container here that I'm going to fill with aquarium water from that tank. And it's going to be rinse water if there are any eggs uh, in, the, in the containers. So then what we need to do is find out if there's eggs in those containers and give them back. All the fish are in the pots. Um, so all you do Move it over. Minimally affects the fish. You lift the pot out. <clears throat> Bring over here the shoebox container. Now, when I first started doing this, I was picking the marbles out one by one, and, and it was taking all this time. And I was like, "Oh my goodness, how am I going to do this?" It's actually a very simple way to do it, and it gets all the eggs. And all you do is put your hand over here. I dump it all in, and then I look in there, and if I see any eggs, then I ask what this is for, go ahead and pour this in. And then I will usually go ahead then, and then do the same thing from the other side. And that gets all the eggs. I'll put the marbles here. Here you just put it back. Here, see there's any eggs down there. Right now there's not any. This this batch around. Let's check around. But uh, that's how you harvest the eggs. It takes five minutes. And uh, if there's any eggs at all, you catch every one. And then you would immediately go ahead and then move them over to the basket in the breeding tank with the methylene glue. Uh, so they can hatch. So, simple as that. As you can see, there is aeration from the box filter. The uh, temperature is in at 80 degrees. 
So that's about where that's kept at. The uh, water gets circulated uh, four times a day for an hour from this tank down here where there's a layer of crushed uh, oyster shell. Uh, my pH is generally about 7.4 with the uh, uh, oyster shell. It's, uh, I try to keep it up around 7.8 to 8.0. Right now it's probably about 7.8 because that oyster shell is getting kind of old. It's been there for a while. Um, and so those are the water conditions. Okay, it's about three days before the full moon. And I got my first, the first eggs, the first spawning is starting. Uh, you can see in here, it's not a, not a big batch. It's only probably about 100, 150 eggs. But uh, these were just scooped out. So I'm gonna get them into some methylene blue. And they'll be hatching in 24 to 48 hours. So I've been checking for eggs every morning and every night. Uh, and today is the day that is the calendar full moon. And I've never had them spawn this late before. I had the earlier batch uh, filmed just a little while ago. And today I seem to have pulled out a couple hundred eggs. So as I mentioned, I had just switched out with some new young males. And it may just be that because this is their first spawn and, and they're younger, that they're doing things a little later than the older fish do. But, um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I've never had eggs after the full moon before, but I'm going to go ahead and check and keep checking for a couple of days just to see if uh, any more spawns keep happening. But these guys are going to go ahead and get put in with the earlier batch into the floating container in the methylene blue. Now these eggs are just pulled, it's actually the day after the full moon. I've never had eggs laid this late before, um, but these were laid since last night. So it's one day after the full moon, so I'm just going to keep checking every 12 hours until uh, I don't continue to continue to, to harvest eggs. So right about now, or maybe a little bit earlier, I probably should have done this, but what I just did is I took a turkey baster and scooped up about one turkey baster full of some of the sand and gravel from the bottom of the tank and put it into the breeder with the uh, the new young that are hatching, the new eggs. Uh, that way there'll be some infusoria in there for the uh, fry to eat uh, when they hatch. When I've looked very closely, the hatching is continuing. There's actually quite a bit going on, but it can be discouraging when you look in there and you see all of the white eggs. But uh, don't worry, just give it a couple days and you will eventually start to see the results.
Thank you for watching this first video on breeding the Cynodonis lucipinus. Um, and be sure, of course, to stick around for the second video and see how they age out and see how many live to be a month old and such. I expect that this breeding procedure would probably work for a number of species. They would certainly work for the Petrocola, which of course are closely related. And the Petrocola and the Lucipinus are not the same fish. They're quite different. Um, the Lucipinus is a smaller fish. Generally, when they're younger, they can appear very similar. And I know there's all this stuff on the internet about, you know, smaller dots, bigger dots, where they're spaced, you know, yada, yada. Um, I don't know much about that. I kind of treat, I had both here for many years. Um, and I treated them like a lot of my live bears that can be similar in appearance, particularly when they're young and just kept them separated. But when they become adults, the Petrocola is a much larger, huskier fish. The Lucipinus is a, is a, is a slimmer, uh, smaller, uh, more more delicate in appearance fish but most importantly for me is with the Petrocola I didn't see the high white background and the high contrast that the Lucipinus will show and the Lucipinus also uh, has that bright white uh, front fin uh, spines on their pectorals dorsals and tail fins that you know look so nice which I don't generally see on the Petrocola as much so anyway they are very different fish uh, this should work as well. I've not tried them or considered them with the, the Decorus or some of the other Synodonis uh, that breed similarly. So uh, if you try it or give it a shot and it works, let me know. So anyway, enjoy the next video and thank you for watching this one and I'll see you soon.